Verstatin is a virulence inhibitor and can be synthesized using 1,8-naphthalamide. 1,8-naphthalamide contains this functional group right here. This functional group is known as an imid or an imid. By reacting 1,8-naphthalamide with these reagents right here, we convert the imid functional group into an ester group. Next, we convert our ester functional group by reacting our intermediate product with these reagents right here to create a carboxylic acid. This will then form our target compound, Verstatin. Now, whenever we synthesize our products, we want to verify that we do in fact have our target compounds at each stage of the synthesis. And we can do that by characterizing what we synthesize through the use of IR spectroscopy, proton NMR spectroscopy, carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, and so forth. Today, we will be using proton NMR spectroscopy to characterize our molecules. I've gone ahead and drawn out all the protons of the molecular structure for the molecule, and I've also gone ahead and boxed in the protons that are chemically equivalent to one another. Also, I've gone ahead and wrote down the multiplicity of each signal. So for the P protons, we have one neighbor so we would expect to see a doublet for the signal. For the Q protons, it has two neighbors, so we would expect to see a triplet for its signal. For the R protons, it has one neighbor, so we would expect to see a doublet for its signal. So if we look here in the aromatic region of our proton NMR spectrum, we see that there are indeed signals appearing in the aromatic regions. So this is a good sign that we have 1,8-naphthalamide. If we look at the integration values here, we see that each integration corresponding to the signals here are approximately two. So this denotes that there are two protons in each of these three major signals. This small signal right here actually corresponds to the proton that's on this nitrogen right here. But we will go ahead and ignore that because we primarily want to focus our attention on these aromatic protons. You'll see why this is important later on when we analyze the other spectra for our other products that we form. Next, let's discuss which signals we will assign. So as you can already see here, I've assigned this signal for P. This signal corresponds to the R protons and this signal corresponds to the Q protons. Let me walk you through the rationale behind this. As you can see here, this signal is a triplet, and the only triplet that we would find would correspond to the Q protons. Now, P and R are both doublets, so how do we discern between the two? If we look at the chemical environment of the P protons, you would see that it's closer to the imid functional group. Because it's closer to the imid functional group, this will deshield these P protons here and we would then expect it to be at a higher ppm value. Another way of saying this is we would expect the P protons to appear more downfield. The R protons, however, are furthest away from this imid functional group, so these ones are more shielded compared to the P protons. So this is why this signal right here corresponds to the P protons, and this signal right here around 8 0.25 ppm corresponds to the R protons. Next, let's analyze the proton NMR spectrum for Verstatin ethyl ester. Before we begin, we want to ignore this peak, this peak, and this peak. This peak right here is a water peak, so we can go ahead and ignore that. This large peak is actually a residual solvent peak, and this corresponds to chloroform. This signal right here corresponds to acetone. Acetone is detected because sometimes when you run your NMR sample, the probe that you use might contain a small amount of acetone when you're cleaning it. So that small trace of acetone gets detected when you run your proton NMR. So we can ignore these signals when we perform our analysis. Now you might have noticed that the integration values are awfully large. And if you try to reduce them, you'll actually find that they do not correspond to the number of protons that you would expect for each of these signals. 
So what are we to do to figure out which signals correspond to the protons that we've assigned and labeled in this structure? Well, for one, we can look at the chemical environment for each proton signal, and we can also look at its multiplicity to decide which signals to assign. For instance, the protons that I've labeled E are next to a nitrogen and two carbonyls. This has a large deshielding effect on these protons, so we would expect it to be more downfield. These protons also contain two neighbors, so we would expect the E signal to be a triplet. As you can see right here, this signal around 4.24 ppm is in fact a triplet. And the chemical shift of this signal corresponds to the chemical environment of these E protons. Next, let's do a side-by-side -side comparison between our proton NMR spectrum of our starting reactant and the verstatin ethyl ester. So the top spectrum is our verstatin ethyl ester, and the bottom spectrum is our 1,8-naphthalamide. As you can see here, the change that occurred is the formation of these signals right over here. So the presence of these signals confirms that we no longer have our starting reactant. However, there is a problem. If we go back to the proton NMR spectrum of verstatin ethyl ester, you'll notice right here in the aromatic region that although we've properly assigned the signals to the corresponding protons, there appears to be some overlapping signals that are occurring in the aromatic region. Because you can see right here, we were expecting the G signal to be a triplet, but we're not exactly seeing that because if you focus your attention right here, there's an extra signal that was detected in our NMR spectrum. So obviously we have an impurity in our sample, but where could this impurity have come from? And more specifically, what molecule would produce an impurity only in the aromatic region? Well, if we take a look at the side-by-side -side comparison, we would find that the impurity arises from our starting reactant. And this makes sense because sometimes when you perform a synthesis, not all of your starting reagent gets fully converted into your product. So in actuality, these three signals right here contain our 1,8-naphthalamide starting reactant. So these signals are actually a combination of the F protons in this structure and the P protons from our starting reactant. This signal at 8.23 ppm is actually a combination of our H protons from this structure right here and the R protons from our starting material. And lastly, the signal at 7.78 ppm is a combination of the G protons and the Q protons. Even though we have successfully synthesized the verstatin ethyl ester for our intermediate product, there is still a little bit of unreacted starting material. Even though the intermediate sample is impure, we can still proceed and form our target molecule for statin. So we go ahead, proceed with the synthesis, and we produce verstatin. And now we characterize our product by using proton NMR spectroscopy. And we have here the spectrum that we get from our sample. Once again, we will ignore this large peak because this is simply excess chloroform that got detected by the NMR machine. We will also ignore the integration values because if we try to reduce them, we actually find that the values do not give you the accurate number of protons for that signal. Instead, we will rely on analyzing the chemical environment for each proton signal, as well as its multiplicity. As you can see, I've assigned each signal to each proton in our structure in the aromatic region. M, O, and N correspond to the aromatic protons. This signal L corresponds to these protons here. J and K correspond to these protons right here. Now, if we compare this spectrum to the previous proton NMR spectrum for verstatin ethyl ester, we would find that there's a disappearance of a couple alkyl signals within this region of our spectrum. So this proton NMR spectrum confirms that verstatin is present in our sample. However, just as we've encountered in the previous spectrum, these signals right here have some overlap with some other signals that were detected by the NMR machine. So once again, we have to ask ourselves, 
what impurity only shows up only in the aromatic region of the NMR spectrum? And once again, the answer is our starting reactant, 1,8-naphthalamide. So we see that the problem persisted even in the formation of our final product, where some of the starting material remained unreacted and is now contaminating our final product. So similarly to the previous spectrum, these three signals are actually a combination of these protons here, as well as the protons from our starting reactant, 1,8-naphthalamine. So even though we successfully synthesized our target molecule, Verstatin, it was not 100% pure and contained some portion of our starting material as an impurity. And high purity is important when it comes to drug synthesis. As I mentioned earlier, Verstatin is a virulence inhibitor and Verstatin is used to treat cholera. If you were to give this Verstatin to a human being, the impurity that's present in this sample of Verstatin could be enough to kill the person. So even though we may produce Verstatin in high yield, if it's highly impure, it's ineffective to use it as a drug. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the purity of our final product. And we'll do that by using a method called quantitative proton NMR. And we're specifically going to use the 100% method. The first step in the 100% method is to choose the cleanest signal for our product. In this case, we cannot use the signals in the aromatic region because they are impure. We will not use the signal for K here because there seems to be some impurity present right around here. So that leaves us between the signal L and the signal J. I'm going to choose the signal J because it'll be a little easier working with an integral value value of 10 and I'll show you why. So once we have decided what the cleanest signal is, we need to find the normalized integral value for one proton. So we know that this signal J corresponds to these protons right here. How many protons is this? Well, it's two protons. So the signal J consists of two protons, but we have the integral value that is 10. So we can set up a relationship here. So we can say that 10 is equal to two protons. We want to find the normalized integral value. So we want to find an integral value that's equal to one proton. Well, if we divide 10 by two, we get five. So our normalized integral value of five is worth one proton. So we can use this newfound relationship kind of like a measuring stick because what this enables us to do is go to the signals that contain impurities such as these three signals in the aromatic region and we can determine how much of the signal is our target compound Verstatin and how much of it is our starting reactant 1,8-naphthalamide. Remember here that each of these signals is a combination of our final product and the starting reactant. And remember that the number of protons for this signal right here is four. However, two protons correspond to our final product and two protons correspond to our starting reactant. So really, we have two protons plus two protons in this signal. So remember the relationships that we found here previously, and we now know that the normalized integral value for our target compound is worth five for every one proton. Well, we know that our target molecule has to have two protons, so there must be an integral value of 10 in here. Knowing that information, we can take 13 0.03 and subtract away 10. This gives us 3.03. So this means that the two protons that are found in that signal, we know for sure that it's worth an integral value of 10, and the integral value of our impurity is worth 3.03. And remember that this 3.03 corresponds to the integral value for the two protons of our starting reactant, 1,8-naphthalamine. So we would repeat this process for the other two signals. 
here we would take 13.03 and we would subtract 10. Here we would take 13.14 and subtract it from 10 so that we can find the integral value for the impurities. So what we've effectively done is subdivide the signals that contain impurities in it. What I've gone ahead and done here is produce the table to collect all the information that will be needed in order to calculate the percent purity of our sample. I have here the chemical shift values for where the signals were at. This column right here is the integral value that was given on the spectrum. And this right here is the integral value for our product. Now remember we calculated that based on the clean signal in our spectrum for our target molecule. And remember that at each of these signals right here, specifically the ones in the aromatic region, it's a combination of our product, which I symbolize with the letter P, and our impurity, which I represent with the letter I. And we know that the number of protons that correspond to our product in the aromatic region is two, and the number of protons that correspond to the impurity in the aromatic region is also two. Remember, we only have one impurity in here, so if we had multiple impurities, this table would expand and we would have to subdivide and create even more values. So once again, we take 10 and subtract it from 13.03 to find the integral of our impurity to be 3.03. But remember, this corresponds to two protons. What we have to do is we need to divide 3.03 by 2 to get a normalized integral value. In this case, it would be 1.52. Again, we repeat that for the signal at 8.235 ppm, and we also get 1.52 as our normalized integral. The signal at 8.6, we would take 13.14 minus 10 and we get 3.14 for the integral of our impurity. Remember that this corresponds to two protons and we divide that by the number of protons to get 1.57 as our normalized integral. Remember that these integral values correspond to one proton. The next step is we need to find an average normalized subintegral for the impurity. And we do that by adding these three values right here and dividing it by three. And we get an average normalized subintegral of 1.53. Now we have all the necessary values needed to plug into this formula right here. I want to quickly go over what these values are. So this term right here corresponds to the normalized integral that we calculated for the clean signal. So in this case, it would be five. This right here represents the molecular weight of our target analyte. And our target analyte is verstatin, which is our targeted compound. So the molecular weight of verstatin is 283 0.28 grams per mole. And we divide that by the same terms right here. So we just repeat those values. So five times 283.28 grams per mole. And now we have to add in all the impurities and we multiply all the impurities by its molecular weight. Remember that in, in our situation, we only have one impurity. So we would take 1.53 for our normalized integral of our impurity, which we calculator right here as an average, and we multiply that by the molecular weight of our impurity. And remember, we only have one impurity, and that's 1,8-naphthalamide. So the molecular weight of 1,8-naphthalamide is 197.19 grams per mole. If we had two or more impurities, we would have to repeat this setup again, where we have to find the normalized integral value of the second or third impurity and multiply it by its respective molecular weight. Lastly, you multiply 100 to get a percent value for the purity of our sample. In this case, our sample is 82.4% pure. But what if we wanted to find out the percent impurity? We can take 100%, subtract 82.4% to get 17.6%. This value corresponds to the IMID impurity. So 17.6% of our sample is our IMID. And one last thing to note about the 100% method is that it does not take into account any residual solvents or any water peaks in our sample. So even though that 
water or chloroform or acetone are impurities in our proton NMR spectrum, we do not count those because this method does not take into account solvent peaks. I hope this gives a clearer understanding as to why purity is important when it comes to drug synthesis, and I hope that you've learned how to use the 100% method to calculate percent purity in a sample, and thank you for watching.